Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. My name is Tom Lujak. I'm the Vice Chancellor for University Relations here, and on behalf of our interim chancellor, Mike Lovell, again, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's program. This uh, evening's program is sponsored by the Concord Coalition and the Wisconsin Fiscal Advisory Council. UWM is proud to host this event here at UWM's Union, where we have a long history of sponsoring programs that deal with important issues. Uh, in fact, during this political year, we are proud to have uh, be hosting a series of political forums with uh, leading candidates for office. A couple of weeks ago, right in this room, we had candidates for Governor Scott Walker and Tom Barrett uh, do a live broadcast on WUWM as they discuss the issues in the gubernatorial race. And for those of you who are interested, next Wednesday on October 20th, also in this room, we will have the two candidates for the U.S. Senate seat here in Wisconsin, Ron Johnson and Russ Feingold. And again, those programs will be broadcast on WUWM, our public radio station connected to the university. Now at this point, I'd like to turn this evening's program over to Sarah Imhoff, uh, who is a part of the Concord Coalition, who will tell us more about what will unfold in the next few minutes. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here live in Milwaukee and across our satellite campuses throughout the University of Wisconsin system. It's a pleasure to, to be in your state. Um, I greatly appreciate all the panelists who are joining us this evening as well. Um, I'm sure you won't be disappointed in the remarks we're going to hear about the national debt and deficits. Just a quick reminder about the Concord Coalition, if you're not familiar. We're a nonpartisan grassroots educational body. Our mission, quite frankly, is to educate the public, students, um, and all engaged citizens citizens on the challenges, our future fiscal challenges of our country, and uh, try to provide you with some of the tools that you can help us to improve our, our fiscal outlook. Um, one of the things we did specifically last year is a fiscal stewardship project in which several of the community leaders in your state participated. Jim Wood, the chairman of the Wisconsin Fiscal Advisory Council, will be up next. But they worked very, very hard to try to create some sense of what sorts of solutions could come out of Wisconsin and be bubbled up to some of our, our political leaders and, and other folks working to improve the outlook. So without further ado, I'll introduce Jim Wood. And just a reminder, I am the Midwest Regional Director for the Concord Coalition, and I'm happy to speak with any of you after the program if you're interested in getting more information or having having us come speak at, at your um, venue. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Welcome to everybody. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here. I'm Jim Wood, president of Wood Communications Group. Um, I became active in the Fiscal Advisory Council because I'd spent two and a half years helping to organize and run something called the Wisconsin Way. I also sit on the Higher Education Business Roundtable, We the People Wisconsin, which is the oldest civic journalism program in America and spent time running another civic journalism program called Building the New Wisconsin Economy. Three and a half years ago, three years ago, the founders of the Wisconsin Way, which include the Wisconsin Realtors Association, the Wisconsin Education Association Council, Wisconsin Real uh, uh, Counties Association, League of Wisconsin Municipalities, and the Wisconsin Transportation Builders Association, and with communications group, sat in a room and concluded that we were looking at a fiscal train wreck in the state of Wisconsin that if you took a look at our revenue sources, including property tax, income tax, sales taxes, and fees, that it was impossible to match those numbers up with the increased demand that was coming for public services. One of the critical elements in that equation was the fact that one out of every four public dollars spent in the state of Wisconsin is a federal dollar. And that's what took all of us to starting to take a look, a serious look at the national debt and where that was going and what it would mean for Wisconsin. So we did this because we worry about what it means for Wisconsin schools, for Wisconsin seniors, for Wisconsin infrastructure, and all the rest of it. Uh, and so I am absolutely delighted that we have with us four knowledgeable people. I'm gonna keep my remarks as clipped as possible. And my job is, is not to moderate uh, it down, but to facilitate whatever they wish to say. So let me introduce them in the order in which they will speak. Joshua Gordon is to my immediate left is the policy director of the Concord Coalition. He directs the coalition's research on the federal budget, health care, and tax policy. He also oversees Concord's academic outreach activities and served as an advisor on the Concord Coalition's Sundance Film Festival documentary, IOUSA, which if you haven't seen it, is one of the scariest films in America. To his immediate left is Congressman Paul Ryan, 
Paul represents Wisconsin's first congressional district and has done so since 1998. He is the ranking member of the House Budget Committee and a senior member of the House Ways and Means Committee. Paul grew up in Janesville, earned a degree in economics and political science from Miami University. And as you must know, unless you don't watch television or listen to radio or read newspapers, in recent years he has emerged as a major and important new voice in the Republican Party. To his immediate left is Andy Stern. Andy is the former president of the SEIU, the Service Employees International Union, post he took in 1996, he had, after being a member of the union since 1973. He is now a fellow at Georgetown Public Policy Institute and is widely recognized across the country as a major voice and force in the American labor movement. To his immediate left is Lou Rapici, who chairs the Concord Coalition's Youth Advisory Board. He founded the Association of Young American, a nonprofit organization dedicated to helping young Americans become better informed and more engaged in national policy issues. He's a graduate of Franklin Marshall College and the Villanova University School of Law, practices law in Philadelphia. Gentlemen, I'm looking forward to the presentation. Thank you for being here this evening. Hi, uh, I'm Josh Gordon. I'm the policy director from the Concord Coalition. Thank you all so much for showing up. And uh, those watching at home or at the satellite campuses, thank you for tuning in. Uh, what I'm going to do is give you a snapshot of the budget, a snapshot of the fiscal problems we have going forward uh, in the future, uh, and then I'll turn it over to the other panelists to um, discuss uh, their thoughts on the issue. Uh, I want to thank especially Congressman Ryan and uh, Mr. Cern from, for coming. Uh, if you don't know, they're members of the President's Fiscal Commission, and we thought it was really important to uh, allow uh, people to interact with them uh, at a grassroots level to really start to understand what the discussion is in Washington, what the parameters are. So right now, Concord is engaged in a fiscal solutions tour that's going around the country uh, to really discuss with Americans. Uh, they know that there's a fiscal problem, but what are some of the solutions uh, that are honest, um, that we all need to discuss uh, to really um, fix it going forward. So here's the first uh, snapshot. 2010, uh, the fiscal year just ended, uh, and it's not a pretty picture. It's actually quite an unusual year uh, for the federal budget. The budget deficit, the final numbers aren't in quite yet, but it'll be about $1.3 trillion. Um, the deficit is that large because, uh, primarily because of the recession. Uh, during times of recession, you have a huge drop-off of revenues as uh, people who aren't working uh, can't pay taxes and those who are working are making less. Uh, so we have a much lower tax revenue coming into the government and we also have much higher spending. Uh, part of that is because of those mandatory programs um, that are automatic stabilizers uh, that come in and spend more whenever the economy goes down without any congressional action. Uh, and then you also have congressional action that's been taken uh, to... Um, that, that's increased spending uh, to, to attempt to uh, at least ease uh, part of the recession. So uh, that's how we get such large deficits. The number I, I want to focus you on a little bit is the top uh, right number, uh, which is a red uh, bar called interest. Uh, this year we'll spend about $200 billion on interest, uh, and this is really the money that we spend to allow ourselves to keep borrowing. Uh, as we uh, borrow money, uh, we have to pay interest just like you would on a car loan, uh, a student loan, a home mortgage, uh, and the government's no different. We have to pay that interest. The interesting thing is because of this economic crisis, we're actually able to uh, borrow at quite low interest rates. Uh, so even though we've had an extremely large deficit this year and last year's was about the same, our interest costs are actually lower than they were uh, before the crisis. Uh, but it's not going to stay that way. Uh, and as we pull out of the crisis and interest rates return to normal, uh, we'll have a much larger interest burden. Uh, so that's a snapshot in dollar terms. How does it look like uh, compared to recent history uh, as a percent of the economy, which is what economists like to look at uh, to weigh the levels of spending and revenue? Uh, through recent history from the 1980s on, we've tended to spend at about 21% of GDP and tended to tax at about 18% of GDP. Uh, this turned around a little bit in the late 90s where we had a brief period of budget surpluses, uh, but then reverted back to normal. Uh, so just to put this in perspective, we tend to have a 2 to 3% deficit uh, for the federal budget. 
And economists actually think that if you have a 2 to 3% deficit and the economy is growing at about 2 or 3%, that's actually a sustainable trajectory because you're not uh, adding more debt uh, than you can afford with economic growth. Uh, unfortunately, if you look at the projections to the future, even after this economic crisis, uh, where those numbers have drastically diverged, uh, the taxes and spending numbers, uh, we're not going to get back to a place under current policy that will be sustainable. Uh, and so that's why uh, we have to act. And, and the impetus to act uh, comes pretty soon, uh, and, and some might say uh, right now, uh, especially when you look at the problems over the long term. And this graph shows you the problems over the long term. Uh, the highest ever debt we've had as a percent of GDP was right after World War II. It was about 109%. Today we're at 64%, but in the future it's projected to keep growing and growing uh, not a temporary blip like we saw during World War II, but really a, a permanent addition to the debt under current policy. So by 2020, we'll have debt held by the public at about the same level we had after World War II, and that's just in 10 years from now. And then by 2040, the projections show debt held by the public at levels of about 300% of GDP. Now, no one really thinks we'll, that'll happen. It actually can't happen. We won't be allowed to keep borrowing uh, to where we have debt loads three times the size of our economy. Uh, so the question is, do we act sooner rather than later? And the longer we wait, the greater the chance there is of us having a crisis because of that debt. Uh, and in a crisis, we know uh, Congress and policymakers don't tend to have the most amount of time and thoughtful debate uh, about where to go. So the idea is to uh, work now to reduce that projected uh, debt uh, because now we can rationally, hopefully, debate uh, the solutions and let the American people really make a choice before we get to that crisis moment. One of the problems with debt is that we borrow a lot of money, not just from Americans, but from overseas. Uh, so over half of our debt is borrowed uh, from foreigners and foreign governments. Over the last 10 years, about 70% of all the debt we've added has been added by borrowing from foreigners. Uh, and this represents a problem because that mortgage we're paying, that interest we're paying, is actually going uh, into overseas economies and invested overseas, not being reinvested back into our economy. And so that represents an economic loss for us. Uh, and then if you look what happens to interest costs over the next 10 years, uh, they really shoot through the roof as interest rates return to normal. And these projections assume relatively decent economic growth over the next 10 years, and relatively uh, average uh, interest rates, not any kind of hyperinflation scenario. Uh, so by the end of the 10-year period, you're looking at interest costs of over $900 billion. Uh, and by 2020, that will represent more spending than we would be doing on the Defense Department or than we would be doing on all of the other uh, non-defense discretionary spending of the budget. Uh, so that interest cost number becomes a huge part of the budget uh, and just uh, becomes really hard uh, to control. So uh, when you look at characteristics of the federal budget, one of the important things to know is that uh, a lot of the federal budget is on autopilot, and actually 41% of it uh, is just on three programs, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. These programs grow on autopilot. They're tied to uh, when people become eligible based on age. Uh, the amount of spending is uh, a lot based on income level, and of course, healthcare costs. And so these three programs are gonna to continue to take a larger chunk of our federal budgetary pie uh, because of those factors. Uh, and here are the two main factors that you have to uh, understand. We have an aging population. The baby boom generation is gonna leave the workforce and enter retirement. And when they do so, uh, it's not just a blip in our demographics. It's a permanent shift to an older population. Uh, the population across the country will be over 20% uh, over the age of 65. Right now, Florida has about 20% uh, of the population over the age of 65. So really, we like to say we're becoming a nation of Floridas. Uh, now, this isn't, because, this isn't a problem because we don't like old people. Uh, it's a problem because as people leave the workforce, uh, there are less workers paying taxes and more workers or more retirees uh, getting government benefits uh, in those programs. So the aging of the population has a lot to do with our uh, fiscal future, as does healthcare costs. Healthcare costs for the last 40 years grow much more quickly than economic growth, 
They're projected to continue to do so, even if we're able to slow them down. Uh, hardly anyone really thinks we'll, in any uh, short amount of time frame, be able to get healthcare costs to only grow at the rate of economic growth. So when healthcare costs go faster than economic growth, that means every year, no matter how well the economy does, no matter how well uh, profits are uh, for businesses or your wages, uh, no matter how high those grow, healthcare costs continue to take a larger chunk of that. Uh, and this is a hugely problematic issue, and it's definitely unsustainable. All right, so if you look over the next 30 years of the federal budget, uh, and you look at these projections that I've given you, which I, I admit are fairly scary, uh, what are the main sources of those problems? Uh, well, you really have growth in these four categories. It's Medicaid, Social Security, Medicare, and interest on the debt. And, and remember, that interest cost is really just an example of the fact that we're spending more than we're taking in. And then those other programs are because of aging and uh, healthcare costs. So these four uh, items are the ones that are projected to grow in the future. That doesn't mean other items in the budget uh, aren't ripe for, uh, for looking at, uh, for budgetary cuts. That doesn't mean uh, the tax code is off the table uh, to look at in order to make up some of that gap. Uh, what it does mean is that you still have to find a way to slow the growth uh, in those programs. And here's just one other way of looking at it. If you look at that yellow line as the average of what uh, tax revenues Americans pay, uh, and Americans already uh, are unhappy with the amount of taxes they pay to the federal government. Uh, we tend to tax at that 18% of GDP over the last 40 years. If you look at that line as being relatively static, uh, then over the course of the next 40 years, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid take up pretty much all federal revenues. Uh, and that leaves all other spending of the government on defense and non-defense, education, transportation, you either have to cut it completely or you have to continue borrowing for it. And, and as you see, as we continue to borrow to support that spending, the interest costs uh, just dramatically increase more quickly uh, than all the other spending problems. So uh, this is what the fiscal future looks like if we leave policy untouched. Uh, and so I'll turn it over to our uh, next uh, panelists to discuss uh, what we might be able to do about it. Congressman Ryan. Thank you, John. Sure. Somebody's got that figured out somewhere. Whoever did the laptop, thank you. Um, so Josh and I didn't talk beforehand about our presentations. Mine's going to look very similar. <laughs> You'll just see the same charts just done in a different way. Um, no, but in all seriousness, uh, what I'll do is I'll go briefly through diagnosis of the problem because you just got that and go to um, some of the solutions that I've been um, pushing myself. Um, where are we now? Okay, here's the state of things fiscally and economically right now. We have unemployment at 9.6%. That's not just bad because people are out of work, but that also drops revenues of the federal government and deteriorates our fiscal situation. Um, we are courting our own lost decade, I would argue, with, because of the government fiscal and monetary policy we have right now. We're actually practicing economic policy very similar to what the Japanese did, who are now entering in their second lost decade. We have looming tax hikes on the horizon. Those looming tax hikes are scheduled to occur across the board for businesses, individuals, families, capital in January, and then again in 2013. So that is the specter on the horizon with respect to the economy. That is combined with the fact that we have record deficits and debt, as, as Josh just mentioned. Now, <clears throat> Josh went through this, but I, I'll emphasize an additional point. Who owns our debt? A lot of countries lend money to themselves. The Japanese are pretty good about that. They have a high savings rate. They buy their own bonds. We did that in World War II, war bonds. We used to do that as, as well. Back in the 70s when our debt was about $283 billion, foreign holdings of our debt was 5%. In the 90s when our debt was about $2.4 trillion, foreign holdings of our debt was 19%. Today, foreign holdings of our debt are 47%. We have a $9 trillion debt held by the public. Uh, we are basically saying we need to borrow about half of our borrowed money overseas. And what that does is it compromises our economic sovereignty. It makes it more difficult for us to look out after our national interests. Now, these are the kinds of comments you see all of the time. This is just something I clipped out of a newspaper not too long ago. You know, a cartoon about how <clears throat> China saying, turn around or we'll sell our, t our T-bills. What we're doing by being dependent on other nations, other central banks, 
um, is we are compromising our national interests, our economic sovereignty. Now, where are we headed? Josh went through that. I'll go through it fairly briefly. We are headed for a real tsunami. And so the budget we are living under right now shows us, does this thing have a laser pointer on it? Shows us uh, deficits that are enormous out into the future. Uh, Congress chose this year not to do a budget. Um, for the first time since the 1974 Budget Act passed, uh, the House didn't do a budget. Last year, Congress did pass a budget, so a budget is in force. It was the first Obama budget. What that budget does is it racks up deficits that go down after some spike in spending from TARP and other things go away. We go down to deficits just below $800 billion, and then we go back up to a trillion-plus dollar deficits. What this budget we're living under does right now is it doubles our debt in five years, triples it in about 10 years. Now, we've had debt before, and as Josh mentioned, we've, this is the history of our debt from just going back to World War II. And the credit markets um, have proven to be fairly resilient when you incur debt, even large amounts of debt, so long as that debt is considered temporary. Fighting a war is a temporary thing. We went up to 109% of GDP in World War II over to the left axis here, um, but we did not see an explosion in interest rates. We did not see uh, lots of problems that accompany big debt rack up, a uh, big spike in debt, because it was considered temporary. So you can borrow for a short period of time if it is, if it is known conclusively that the borrowing is going back down. Problem is, here's where we're headed, and Josh just showed you this one. Our current policy, this is the Congressional Budget Office saying, the current policy of our debt hits the stratosphere. Economists are telling us, and they've come to the commission to tell us this, that once you hit 60% of GDP, that's starting to go in the danger zone. Once your debt gets to about 90% of GDP, you really start slowing down your economy. There's an analysis by two well-known economists that go back into hundreds of years of data from all different countries that says once your debt hits about 90% of GDP, slow growth, more unemployment, real stagnation. Our debt gets up to about 800% of GDP by the end of the century. It just goes to the stratosphere. Now, what's the big driver? I'll do this quickly again, because Josh just went through this. This is what we do, those of us who are in this fiscal issue. Um, the entitlement programs are the primary driver of these things. What Congress does do is every year it does appropriations. That means Congress, through the power of the purse, is in charge of what we call discretionary spending, which is about 40% of the budget. The big drivers are what we call entitlements, the autopilot programs that Congress does not, on an annual basis, set uh, spending targets. If you qualify for the benefit, you get it. It's therefore an entitlement. That is what is really driving this, and, and Josh went through. It's a combination of aging and a combination of health care prices. I asked the Congressional Budget Office, well, what would the tax rates have to be on Americans in the future if we just settle this through taxes? And so they got back to me. I'm, consequently, I'm 40 years old. My wife and I have three kids. We live in Janesville. Uh, they're five, seven, and eight years old. So I, I try to kind of run numbers through what it's going to be like for my kids when they're living in Janesville, raising their family in the same age. What will the world look like for that? Well, here's what they told us. The lowest tax rate over here to the left um, in mid-century goes from 10% bracket to the 19% bracket by the end of the century when my kids are, you know, getting up in their years and, having, and my grandkids are around running their lives, 25% bracket. The middle income tax brackets go up to 47%, then up to 66%. And the top rate, this is the one that all those successful small businesses pay, the subchapter S corporations, that goes to 66% and then up to 88%. This is an illustration by the Congressional Budget Office on the kinds of tax rate increases that would have to incur on our society if we're going to keep this spending on this binge that we are on. They put euphemistically the next sentence after they sort of highlighted this path for me that this could, this could actually harm economic growth in America in the future. <laughs> so, no kidding. So, the point I'm trying to say is you can't tax your way out of this problem. If you try to do it, you'll kill the economy. You'll squander opportunity. Um, here is the point I'm trying to make. If there's anything I want to leave with you, it is this. The sooner we deal with this, the better off we are all going to be. It, 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 less people get hurt, the better we can shape these things, the better more gradual changes will occur, the more that we can do it on our own terms. Take a look at Greek, the Greeks, take a look at Europe. They're in the fit of a debt crisis, imposing these austerity plans, cutting pensioners, cutting benefits to current seniors, raising taxes on their economy, slowing down their economy. Here's what I'm trying to say. 
Last year, the General Accountability Office, and this is one of the more conservative estimates of this problem, was telling us that our total unfunded liabilities, the, the promises our government is making through these entitlement programs to everybody around today, my mom's generation, my generation, my kids' generation, was $62.9 trillion. That's $63 trillion of money that we're making promises that we don't have, meaning we would have to set aside $63 trillion today, invested at Treasury rates, so that we could actually pay these bills. That was last year. Fast forward a year, that total is now $76 trillion. Go ahead 10 years, and I think that it's going to be a bigger number than what they're telling us right now, $83 trillion. The point is this. Every year we delay, every year we kick the can down the road and don't do anything about this, we go a few trillion dollars deeper into debt. The whole point I'm trying to make is if we act now, my argument is we can actually have prosperity. We can actually get jobs created back in this country. We can put our country on a sound financial footing and we can meet the missions of these very important entitlement programs. And so that's what I'm pointing out. We have to chart a new course. This is the whole point of the Fiscal Commission. And so when I became the, um, the top um, person on the Budget Committee for the Minority Party in the last session of Congress, I decided with this new um, opportunity to try and put together a plan, to put together in something that says, here's how I would fix this problem. My point in doing this was not necessarily to say, here's the only way to fix our entitlement problem, our budget problem, and this is the take it or leave it plan. My point in doing this was to say, here's my idea, here's my plan, please, other Republicans, other Democrats, bring your idea to the table. Let's get on to the business of talking about how to fix these problems instead of pointing fingers at each other. You see, the problem we have in Washington is we have so much political paralysis because this problem has been weaponized politically. It is called the third rail for a reason. You touch it and you die politically. So both political parties run all these ads, you're seeing a few of them on TV right now, trying to say if somebody is out there advocating idea, advocating a solution, they're gonna get fried and cooked by the other party and, and, and both parties have done this to each other and that's why we had this political paralysis. My goal was to try and break that paralysis, try and just put something out there to say that we gotta get on to the business of tackling these economic problems because if we don't, they're gonna tackle us. And what I wanna show you is that we can fix this problem. It is not too late to fix these problems in America. It is not too late to put us on a path toward economic prosperity, toward job creation. It is not too late to keep our size and scope of our government relatively limited and consistent in the size that it has historically been. And it is not too late to put this debt on a path to being actually paid off, not just down, but paid off, while still fulfilling the mission of these very important social insurance strategies that we created in the 20th century. So I put out a plan called the Roadmap for America's Future. I first put it out during the Bush administration in 2008 because I thought we were on the wrong fiscal path then and then put out a newer version in 2010 in January, uh, again with newer numbers, uh, this time scored by the Congressional Budget Office. Basically the path that it shows you is this, and I'll show you three basic metrics. Number one, current policy shows the growth of our government going through the roof. Let me put it this way. For the last 40 years, we've taken 20 cents out of every dollar made in America just to pay for the federal government. Uh, by the time my kids are my age, we're going to have to take 40 cents, not 20, 40 cents out of every dollar just made in America just to pay for this federal government. The point that the roadmap makes, according to the Congressional Budget Office, is it basically keeps the size of our government relatively consistent versus the size of our economy so that we can maximize economic growth. Here's what the debt shows you. As I mentioned, the debt goes up way up about 800% of the economy. I mean, literally, once you hit 90%, you start slowing it down, and you basically crash the economy if we actually go on this course. The roadmap, according to the Congressional Budget Office, puts us on a path to not only keep our debt manageable, keep it below 100%, but then get it actually paid off through the century. The reason there's a bump in that line, which, which those of us who map this stuff call the pig and the python, is because the baby boomers. We're gonna have all these boomers coming through the system. We have promises that we need to keep to retirees and we have to finance those promises. And we can finance those promises, meaning borrowing can go up a bit so long as we lock in the kinds of structural reforms that we know that the borrowing is gonna go back down, that it's gonna be paid back off. That will give us the breathing room we need in the credit markets, in the economy, with interest rates, to make sure we can finance these things, these promises we've made. Now here's what it's all about at the end of the day. It's all about whether or not we're gonna sever the American legacy or we're gonna continue it. 
My old man, uh, he told me when I was a kid, two things all the time. Son, you are either part of the problem or you're part of the solution. And he usually told me that when I was being part of the problem. Um, but the point I'm trying to make is I want to get out there with ideas on here's how I would work to solve the problem. Not everybody's going to like it. These things involve trade-offs. But it's important to be a part of the solution. The second thing he always told me is in this country, every generation tackles the big challenges that are confronting it so that the next generation is better off. World wars, Great Depressions, or whatnot. This is our generation's greatest challenge. And if we mess this up, we know irrefutably, every independent fiscal authority testifies to this, that we're giving the next generation a lower standard of living, a, a, a country with fewer opportunities, with less economic growth, fewer jobs, and as CBO measured this, per capita GDP, or in other words, standard of living, lower standards of living. With the roadmap, which is with these kinds of reforms, tackling this fiscal challenge now, putting these reforms in place, according to the Congressional Budget Office, gets us on the path of continuing the American legacy of having ever higher increasing living standards for future generations. The reason that that red line, the current policy line, ends right there is because the Congressional Budget Office says that the entire economy crashes. Uh, two years ago, when they originally ran these numbers, the economic model said that in 2038, the economy crashed. The, the computer model that measures the economy going forward can't conceive of how the economy will continue because of the debt burdens. Well, that date now is 2027. They just re-ran these numbers this summer. And so they're saying by 2027, the, the CBO, the model, the computer can't conceive of how the economy continues. So the point I would simply make is we've got to get a handle on this. Now, I'll simply close with a very quick Cliff Notes version of what I propose. We have to have some consistent values as we guide ourselves through this. And I think in the 20th century, we reached consensus on a number of values. We ought to have a safety net. We ought to have a safety net that catches people who can't help themselves, that helps people who are down on their luck. We ought to have a system so that in, in retirement, people don't fall below the poverty line. We need to fulfill the mission of these programs, health and retirement security. But we're going to have to do it in a way that's sustainable so that the next generation doesn't get robbed of a better future. And so what I propose is if you're 55 and above, nothing changes. You've already retired or you're about to retire. So we should not yank that rug out from under people who are already in or near retirement. But if you're 54 or below like many of us are, I got news for you. These programs aren't going to be there like they're structured today because they can't be there. They're unsustainable. So change them to reflect the 21st century. Change them now so we have time to organize lives around the new changes in the programs. And the way in which I propose to change them are basically to replicate the kinds of benefits I have as a congressman or a federal worker. The same kind of health care package I have as a congressman becomes the Medicare program. And the same kind of social security system I have as a congressman is a voluntary choice for younger people if they want to get a better rate of return on their payroll taxes. So that's the Cliff Notes version, but I'll simply say this. I think we have to make a decision on who in society we need to protect the most. I would say people who are low income and people who have high health care costs or poor health condition. That's the way I organize the benefit here. And if you're a wealthy person, you don't need as much subsidy as everybody else. So I am in form of what we call means testing not giving people as much money if they're a wealthy person. Those things combined help us get the kinds of reforms that get these numbers going in the direction we're talking about so that we can have this line, higher living standards for the future. Change now, you can have prosperity. You can give people time. We can do it on our own terms. We can phase in reforms gradually. You kick the can down the road, and it's Greek-like austerity. It is painful cuts to current seniors. It is big tax increases that deprive jobs from young people that slow down our economy. Those are the choices. That's sort of the proverbial fork in the road we are in right now. And I would simply argue we need to get this to an adult level of conversation, get through the silly season of the election, have an adult level of conversation so that we can make the right kinds of choices, prioritize these things, so that America can pick the right way and reclaim this, this legacy. Thank you very much. So it's, a, it's enormously hard to follow two of the uh, leading experts on the federal budget. And you know, for me, the numbers are always interesting. Uh, but there's somewhat of a bigger and broader context that I want to put it in that sort of builds on what has been said before me. 
Um, this is an American moment. There are big decisions that this country needs to make, and they just didn't happen as a result of the last couple of years, but it may have happened because we've sort of refused to confront what is really happening. And you could just probably go out in Milwaukee and think about what this town was like 20 or 30 years ago, the kind of industries were around, the kind of lives that were lived, and look at it today and appreciate that our world is changing rather fundamentally. And what I like to say is I love this country. I happen to think America is a gift. And its greatest gift is that people came here from all over the world, like my grandfather Lewis, who was a butcher in Newark, New Jersey. Now, my grandfather, all he ever expected from America is he was going to work really hard. And all he ever hoped for that maybe, just maybe for him and his wife, uh, his work would be rewarded. But what my grandfather Lewis came to this country, like so many people, is because he wanted his son Milton and his grandson Andrew to lead a better life than he did. That is the American dream. And despite a civil war, two world wars, recessions, depressions, natural disasters, 43 different presidents, that unique and special and incredible American dream has endured up until now. Uh, today, 79% of all Americans say their children will not do better than they do. And that is not the America we want, and that is not the America we need. And that's really what this discussion is all about, about the future of our country. But we need to understand that besides just the statistics about the deficit, that something very profound is going on and that we are witness to history. Because our country now joined by the rest of the world is living through the most profound, the most significant, the most transformative economic revolution in the history of the world. And that's a lot of words to say, but if you think about it, there's only been three economic revolutions. The agricultural revolution, and, our, and people got three thousand years uh, to make a transition. The Industrial Revolution, people got 300 years to make a transition. This revolution, and this is the third economic revolution as we change from a manufacturing to a service, knowledge, finance, energy, technology economy, and most importantly from a national to an international economy, this revolution is only going to take 30 years. We're only halfway through it. No single generation of people have ever witnessed so much change in a single lifetime. This revolution is digitized, it's Googleized, it's televised, it's on your screens, in your face, 24-7. It is relentless, it is unending, and it's far from over. And there are a couple things that we now know we need to do as a country, and I always say to Paul, I admire he has a plan. I'll say a little bit about some of my concerns about it a little bit later, but America needs a plan. In the third economic revolution, countries are teams. And Team USA, the red, white, and blue team that I love, is now competing against China and Japan and India and Singapore in a way that no one has ever had to deal with in this country before. And Team USA has no plan. And I don't care if you are a fisherman or a hunter, you, work, you like sports or gardening, you need a plan to be successful in any kind of situation, and Team USA, as Paul has said, has no plan, and we now see the implications of having no plan. And so that's what I really want to talk about. This is a much broader problem with when, which the budget fits. And so just let me say what I think are the elements we need to think about as a country, and then just talk a little bit how the fiscal portion fits in. One is this is not our father's and grandfather's economy. This is no longer a one job in a lifetime economy that people in Milwaukee enjoyed for a long period of time. This is not an economy where my son, who's 24, is not going to only not have one job in a lifetime. He's going to have 9 to 12 jobs by the time he's 35. And so employer-based health care, employer-based pensions, employer-based benefits are really hard to imagine in an economy where people are moving so quickly from job to jobs. And in fact, employers are being created and destroyed in an ever-quickening pace. Two is that we now understand that we had a jobless decade. So we can all look at the president and wonder about the jobs program. We had 10 years from 2010, 2000 to 2010, we did not create one new net job in America. That's a huge problem as a result of this global economic revolution. Three, we know, as, as Paul has said, you know, China is for real. I mean, this is the first real economic competitor that America had, and China, as we all know, has a plan. They have a plan to manipulate their currency. They have a plan to steal our intellectual property. They have a plan to give preference to their businesses. China has a plan. And in the absence of our plan, we see what's happening here. We're making ourselves even in worse shape uh, in this global economy. 
And we also know that for the last 30 years, American workers really haven't gotten a raise. And if anything was important in cities like Milwaukee was that if you worked hard, you got ahead. And yet for the last 30 years, and most importantly for the last seven or eight years, the gap between the rich and the rest of the population has grown so wide and so fast that Alan Greenspan once said it threatens democratic capitalism. You know, we cannot sustain a lack of wage growth and inequality in our country and think that we can fix these problems. Because in the end, the best way to fix these problems is economic growth and jobs. It doesn't fix it alone. It is not an excuse for making lots of changes. But it cannot be ignored as if somehow, if we keep giving more and more money to the people at the top, that somehow it'll trickle down and it'll work. And finally, we need to understand that the markets don't work like they used to. You know, John Kennedy once said, a rising tide raises all boats. And I would say a rising tide is raising the luxury liners, and the rest of the boats are in pretty choppy waters right now. The market in the 21st century cannot be worshipped as people tried to do in the 21st century. Deregulating, privatizing, market worshipping is not going to work. We need a plan. So let me just talk quickly about what that means. Here's basically the issue about uh, what I said about wage growth. You know, most of the wage growth in America, we all know this now, it's a fact, has gone to people at the higher income levels. Two is just to make sure we don't play games with numbers. You know, like this, watch these two charts. This is a chart, and you look at it and you'd say, God, discretionary spending is really a problem. We have to do something about it. Um, but if you flip the chart differently, you get to what Paul uh, and others have said, that the real problem here is health care and the net interest. Uh, the truth is discretionary spending, you could wipe it off the map tomorrow. Social Security is a pension plan that needs to be uh, rebalanced, and it can be. Uh, you know, revenues are obviously an issue and a decision we have to make, one of the choices, as Paul said. But we are in trouble significantly because people are getting older. Healthcare inflation is greater than uh, general inflation, growing faster, and that our net interest and payments to the debt keep growing. The last couple things I want to say, because I'm not going to spend a lot of time on charts, this is not an American problem. It's not a Democratic or Republican problem anymore. Here's David Walker, uh, who's head of the Pete Peterson Foundation, someone that I think you know, most people appreciate, represents a very strong kind of fiscal responsibility. But here's Larry Michelle from the Economic Policy Institute, who's a very, seen as a very progressive economist. And both of them wrote in an editorial what you see up there. There's a problem. You know, here is, a, it's not a left or right problem. Here's Bob Greenstein for the people in Washington is probably, you know, the greatest defender of poor people in this country. You know, he would say we have a very serious deficit problem. So we should stop having a debate that we have a problem or how big is the problem. We have a problem. It has to be solved. Families have problems. Companies have problems. People have problems. They are choices that you have to make to solve problems. I don't, we've seen that chart before. You understand that a lot of the uh, health care problems is not about aging alone. It's also about the whole question of technology and cost growth uh, as a result of the system we have. The two things I want to just focus on, one is the Department of Defense. And I want to say this, you know, I'm like everyone else, we need to defend our country. Russia needed to defend its country. It went broke defending its country. Its entire economy collapsed defending its country. America now spends as much money on defense as the rest of the world combined. And I don't think we can afford to do that in this new global economy, that other countries have a responsibility to defend themselves. And I think we need to take a look at the Department of Defense budget, which, as you can see, is another chart uh, where if the blue line is kind of holding level the spending adjusted for inflation, you could see uh, it's going up. And everybody say, yeah, that's because we were fighting two wars. But the truth is, if you take out the war spending, and just look at the base Department of Defense budget. And if you had just held constant and accounted for inflation in 2000 for Department of Defense budget, we're $946 billion above where we would have been. Uh, you may think this is just you know, the liberals uh, going after defense. Here's Barney Frank. You've all heard Secretary Gates. And you've also heard others talk about how now our economic security, our debt, is as big a problem to our national security as other factors that we face. Or you can listen to Tom Coburn, you know, one of the most conservative Republican members of Congress who's basically said that defense spending matches what the rest of the world spends. And I strongly believe we can work together for common sense ideas. And so we've done a lot of work on discretionary spending. 
we haven't done the same kind of work on defense spending, and we need to take a look, a good look at that in a way that does not impinge upon or threaten our national defense. But spending money doesn't necessarily mean, as we saw in Russia, that you're defending yourself, because it's the totality of what you do. Um, there are issues about tax reform. Uh, there are opportunities here to do things. And let me just add you know, one last comment. I admire Paul Ryan because he has a plan. I happen to think his ideas about Social Security and Medicare are the wrong ideas. Uh, and they need to be debated and changed. And I, I had welcomed the fact that he's open to saying that that's exactly what he wants to do. I just want to say on the Fiscal Commission, you should be proud that the people there are trying to have that discussion. You know, it happens outside sometimes a uh, public view, but it is a really responsible decision about a very American moment. Because the final thing I want to say is there's no one in this room, there's no one in Congress who really wants to see the American dream die on their watch. And that's what's at stake right now. We can build a much better country. We can reproduce growth. We can see wage growth. We can see new jobs. But it takes a plan. And this is an American moment. Thanks. Good evening. I'm going to focus my remarks a little differently, I guess, than the other uh, three panelists. And I want to start by saying that these issues we're discussing of uh, fiscal responsibility, sustainability, and entitlement reform most significantly impact young Americans. Uh, I say that even though most of the time you talk about entitlement reform, we're talking um, they're generally considered to be issues that impact older Americans, and I want to just go through a couple reasons why I say this. Um, first, any viable plan, and I include the congressman's plan in that, for uh, entitlement reform and fiscal entitlement reform specifically, exempts out those that are currently receiving benefits. And that's an appropriate and sensible uh, thing. Uh, I like to pull the carpet out from under them. You can't, you, that's not something we can do. But with that said, most plans also would say, well, anybody close, we're not going to uh, change the system for them. Well, what that leaves us with is younger generations uh, working and younger and future generations. They're the ones that are going to be affected by whatever the reform is that we come up with. I went one too far. Um, any, I'm sorry. Our debt stands at this point at over $13 trillion. That's an enormous debt that we're passing on to young Americans, to future generations of Americans, that they had no role in creating and which they had no opportunity to oppose. In 2008, the interest on the debt was 8% of the budget, and Josh showed a bunch of uh, slides about how uh, interest on the debt is, is set to really go through the roof. Uh, it's going to be 10%, 15% of the budget we're going to be spending. Imagine that 10%, 15% of your budget was spent on interest on debt that you had incurred. You know, our nation was founded over 200 years ago by a bunch of people who got together and said there are certain principles and inalienable rights that every American has, and they set forth principles for how a just government should work and how it should function. They got set forth in the Constitution, in the Declaration of Independence, and I believe that the current levels of debt and the forecast into the future really offend those founding principles of our country. I've got two quotes up here. I'm only going to talk about the first one for now. From the Declaration of Independence, governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. Ask yourself, what what <clears throat> Excuse me. Ask yourself, what consent have young Americans and future generations of Americans given us today to allocate their resources 20, 30, 40 years into the future? And what right do we have to tell them 20, 30 years from now, hey, you've got to spend 10%, 15% or more of your budget, of your resources, on debt that we incurred? You may be thinking, well, that sounds interesting, rights and principles, et cetera. 
but I really care about some other issue. I really care about education. I really care about national defense. I really care about lower taxes. This is one of my favorite quotes. Uh, I'm sure it did not originate with Vice President Biden, but don't tell me what you value, show me your budget. And the other piece of that is your budget tells me what you, what you value. So whatever issue that you're thinking, well, that's really the issue that matters to me. The government's ability to take action on that issue in the future, and also presently, I would argue, is severely limited when we have such a debt burden and the interest payments that go with it. Uh, and why I say if we do not act on these issues, it's going to most directly impact young Americans. Well, if to me, as relatively, relatively young American, 10, 20, 30 years into the future when it's young people today, those of you who attend school here, are in positions of power, your ability to advocate for and allocate resources on behalf of issues you care about are going to be severely limited. So how do we change course? How do we move forward from this point? I think first we need to recognize that we have finite resources and we can't have everything we want, whether it's defense spending or uh, uh, the way we're currently structuring Social Security and Medicare. And when I say we, I just don't mean elected officials and candidates for office. I mean all of us. We've got difficult choices to make, and you don't hear a lot of people talking in those terms, but we need to start thinking in those terms as, as citizens and demanding that those who would stand for office and are in public life recognize those choices and engage in discussions about them. And if we do that, and if we require those who aspire to public office to really address these issues and make difficult choices, I think it'll help create some safe space where these kinds of discussions can happen. Um, we've got to do that. We've got to move beyond the sophomoric name calling and petulant demagoguery that seems to pass for political discourse uh, at present. And that raises a different point. We need to have civil political discussions and disagreements. I'm not talking about we all get together and hold hands and say, you know, we're all going to smile at each other. But let's be grown-ups. If you had that 10, 15, 20 percent of your budget that was on interest, you'd all sit down and say, hey, we got to address this. Well, it's not any different when we're talking for us as a government, except we have a bigger uh, we have a credit card with a higher limit, but we're getting close. So there needs to be some group of citizens, and I think that's what uh, is so important about what the Concord Coalition is doing. We need to educate our fellow citizens about these issues. We need to get a group of people that stand up, whether that's just citizens or some elected officials, and says, stop. This is too important, the stakes are too high, and we need to be, as I said, grown-ups about this and have uh, an honest discussion about where we are. I do want to at least highlight some great work that some young people from around the country are doing around these issues and encourage the students in the room to, if you're interested, get involved, whether you have your own ideas or want to join in work that other people are doing. Uh, this is uh, a video game that's going to be coming out soon that's web-based. Nicola Moore is producing. It's going to be free, and it's going to challenge players to work off their share of the national debt uh, and in the process learn about the, uh, the debt and ways to address the problem. Uh, it's not, as I said, it's not live yet, but it's coming up soon. You owe me game .com. There's another organization, relatively uh, new, founded by millennials, for millennials, wecan'tpaythattab.org. And uh, one of their uh, co-founders actually appeared before uh, the commission, I believe, in, in, in April. They're going to be at um, John Stewart's rally to restore sanity in the mall later this month. I don't know if any of you have heard about that. Um, but they're really doing some great work. There's plenty of other organizations concerned, Youth of America, Mobilize.org, and our own Concord Coalition, 
There's a gentleman back there, Stefan, who I'm going to make stand up. If you're young and you're interested in getting involved in this issue, talk to Stefan. It's really important that young people get involved around this issue because we're the ones that have the most at stake. Thanks. Well, thank all of you. Uh, we have a number of questions that have come in, and my job is to read those questions. Uh, and I think what we will do is ask Congressman Ryan and Mr. Stern to take first crack at the questions, and then uh, others can chime in. Um, the first one comes from Oshkosh, and the question is, what is the most important policy change or piece of legislation that could help reduce the national debt now? <clears throat> Let me go first. Healthcare, healthcare reform. Healthcare is a driving force. If you go back to these charts and you take a look at uh, the driving, uh, that $76 trillion unfunded liability, most of it is healthcare. Uh, and we're not going to change demographics, uh, not anytime soon. And so getting at the root cause of health inflation, very, very important, and the cost growth of these programs. Um, I'm obviously a strong opponent of the bill that passed this year. I think, well, the actuary from CMS, um, that's the, um, the President's actuary, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, came, testified before the commission and told us that the new law results in bending the cost curve up, not down, in, in exacerbating our deficit problems. So if you really want to get at this issue, you got to get after the health care problem and health care inflation. Okay. I mean, in, in the short run, we, you know, we need people to get back to work. You know, we just don't have enough revenue coming in. We don't have enough economic growth. And, you know, there's only so much you can cut your way out of any problem in the long run, clearly health care. But in the short run, we have to get people working I agree again. That. I agree with that completely. Josh, you will? No. They said it. Okay. Question from Lacrosse. Let me follow up on Mr. Stern's comment. The strength uh, of our middle class is in our middle class, I assume, but the middle class is shrinking. How can we build up the middle class, and how do we facilitate social mobility? Well, I mean, the gift of the country has always been if you work hard, you get ahead, and, and we have a distribution problem, you know, in the sense that we've created a, 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 a industry of K Street lobbyists and people who've sort of poked holes in the tax code to allow for some people to do unusually well, you know, we've sort of lost the forces of trying, you know, of unions and other organizations that at least tried to find ways to share in the success, you know, when companies are productive and are growing. So, you know, to me, you have to have a conscious set of policies to decide, and I think Paul put it in one way also, which is you, you got to decide where the floor is in this country, right? Not just, we all focus a lot on where the ceiling is, but you know, we have a floor that's pretty low compared to lots of other countries in the world. People retire, you know, in Social Security and are in poverty. And, you know, I think there's a whole question of the country deciding as part of making a plan of how do we reward everyone's work, just not just the shareholders and the executives. I don't look at economic policy as sort of a fixed pie. The economy is a fixed pie that then we have to redistribute the slices. I look at it as how do we grow the pie? How do we grow it for everybody? How do you... Um, do the policies that do that. And um, Andy is right about the floor. I agree with that. Uh, my roadmap bill, I actually increase the minimum Social Security benefit to make sure that no single senior falls below the poverty line. I think that's something that we ought to do. And if you do things right, you can do it while making it solvent. Um, we've got to wake up to the fact that we're in the 21st century global economy. It's here whether we like it or not. So we've got to make ourselves competitive. Our business is competitive. Our workers competitive. The things that I've been advocating, which are also included in this roadmap, are you're not going to have the same job for the rest of your life in this century, just like Andy was talking about. So you need to have a system and a culture of lifelong learning, of getting a career that, that gets you ahead of the game. That's why I'm, I'm a big believer in restructuring our job training system. I, look, I live in Janesville. I mean, anybody in Wisconsin knows what's going on in Janesville. I've got lots of my neighbors and friends um, lost their job at the plant, and a lot of them, one of my buddies, uh, you know, he, I, a high school pal of mine, didn't take high school too seriously, um, thought he was going to be at the plant for the rest of his life. Obviously, that's not happening. But now he's taking it seriously, and he's really excited because he has a benefit because of his union 
um, which I think the TAA bill is a good way to, to go. He's going back to Black Hawk Tech to learn to be a, a biology teacher. He's really excited. He's the happiest I've seen him, you know, in his life. Uh, the, we have to have a system where people who get dislocated in industries can get back into a career on track and get into a good career. Then we have to have economic policies that reward us for making things in America and exporting them. I think we should border adjust our taxes. I think we should redo our tax system so that they make American companies ultra competitive in the global economy and we make it such that you want to domicile, you want to headquarter your company in America, not overseas. And we have a tax system that basically penalizes all those things that make us great. Saving, investing, you know, creating, building, manufacturing. We've got to fix our tax code to do that. I can go on and on, but I'll let these other guys take it. Anybody else? Okay. <laughs> That's fine. Um, here's a question. If the U.S. standard of living is higher than the rest of the world, as I believe it is, yes. if we shift our focus from a national economy to a world economy, would we in America see a decrease in our standard of living as the rest of the world sees an increase? Well, you are. I'd say no, no, that's not. It, it is not a zero-sum game. Their gain does not come at our loss, and our gain does not come at their loss. It doesn't work like that. That's not the way the dynamic economy works. Uh, the question we ought to be asking ourselves is in this era of globalization, what are we doing to shape it? What are we doing to lead it? What are we doing to be in front of it? Um, I'm very worried about, obviously, our fiscal policy trajectory, which clearly irrefutably shows you on our own volition, we're taking our living standards and going down. Our monetary policy, I think, is on a collision course with our fiscal policy. Now, that, those are two different things, fiscal and monetary. Fiscal is spending in taxes. Monetary is the Federal Reserve printing money, being the stewards of the world's reserve currency. Both of those are in a dangerous trajectory with one another, and we will wind up debasing our currency if we don't watch this fiscal problem. That in and of itself would dramatically deteriorate our standard of living. If we have a real inflation problem, there's nothing more insidious than that. It wipes out the middle class. It wipes out the savings of people living on fixed incomes. So we've got to get this policy right. And if we get our policy right, like we have in the past, we can lead the world in growing the global economy, in bringing up all different economies, so that we have more consumers who can buy the products we make here in Wisconsin. That's the kind of attitude and that's the kind of aspect we have to have. It's not a beggar thy neighbor policy. It is a policy where we make ourselves lean, competitive, and we prioritize. Let me just to say what they, you know, I, I don't think this is about sort of, you know, leveling the playing field globally. I, I, I want to make clear, I, I want America to win. I want Team USA to be the best team on the field, and that's why I keep repeating, we don't have a plan. This team, you know, whether it's fiscal policy, monetary policy, how do we make our businesses most competitive? How do we, you know, make sure that his buddy gets retrained as a country, not just because he happens to be fortunate to have a union or something? You know, are all issues that are, that are part, you know, of a much bigger discussion of which our budget is only a factor. And if we only focus on this, I think we're going to miss the whole question of how do we build an economy that works and we're Team USA is always number one on the playing field. And yeah. Let me just say one other thing. This idea of a zero-sum game is very prevalent when talking about Washington policymaking. You're always looking at um, who's going to lose by a certain bill, what benefits are going to be cut. And we never really compare um, our, our choices to what would happen if we didn't make any choices. Right. So if we have no plan, as you've heard a lot, uh, that doesn't mean Social Security benefits continue to be paid as they're currently written and Medicare stays the same as it, as it is. It means the country fails economically over the long term. So it's not a zero-sum game. It, it's deciding what kind of country we want in the future, figuring out a way to pay for it, and that is how we all do better in the long run. It's not an issue of some people losing benefits uh, in order for other people to gain benefits. It's we all gain as a country if we make these tough decisions sooner rather than later. That's a very good point. I just want to emphasize it. We, we cannot compare ourselves to this mythical future of all these promises that are being made that we know we can't keep. And in the Social Security question in and of itself, the current law has a 22% across the board benefit cut once we run out of IOUs. So it's not as if we can just keep on going on the path we are on. That is the most dangerous thing we could do of all. 
And, and just to pile on here, um, you know, for people like myself who spend, you know, a lot of time trying to think about how do kids get to college, you know, who are working class kids and how do people get ahead, you know, we should also appreciate if we look at places like California, when we don't have a plan and the crisis hits, the people that tend to get hit are the people who have the least power, the least, you know, the college tuition goes through the roof, the people at the lower end on welfare or healthcare or Medicaid or in nursing homes get cut the most. You know, so it's, it's not as if we do nothing, we just have a perfectly distributed solution. The people with the less power seem to get hurt the most and that's why you need a plan. So you decide as a nation, what are your values and, and what's your budget that responds let me to that. Let me just point out that if you have questions out here, Sarah has cards and if you would just, and, and Dina I, have I, cards and so, nice. If you haven't had a chance to ask a question yet, please. I, I would just to in, inter, interject on that last point that, that the people that don't have any power really are those that haven't even been born yet that are going to real that are going to live with the worst consequences of all this. And anybody uh, think about anybody who doesn't have the right to vote yet, uh, but that is alive. Uh, all your children or grandchildren, they're going to live with these consequences, and they had no role whatsoever in creating them. So in terms of not having any power. Question from here, how will we grow the tax base if almost half of the people are not paying any taxes? You don't. Well, well first of all, let's be fair, people are paying taxes. There's called Social Security taxes, or 6.2% of their payroll. Well, you could decide whether that's a tax or not. I, I think Congressman Ryan would say if we were raising it, it would certainly be a tax increase. So when they're paying it, I don't think it's fair to say people aren't paying taxes. I also think we need to appreciate there's a trillion dollars now of tax expenditures, you know, things that we don't really, are really spending in a different name that we've sort of created all kinds of loopholes, exceptions, and preferences that we're going to have to, and Senator Wyden and Senator Gregg begin to take a look at some of those, you know, issues as well. But, you know, tax policy, you know, needs to be progressive. We have a tax system that's ridiculous. You know, it needs to be completely overhauled. It can't be tinkered with you know, any more. And, you know, tax policies work better when there are uh, a broad base, few exceptions, you know, and progressivity. And I, I think, you know, Congressman Ryan and others have talked about, you know, whether it's going to consumption taxes, like VAT taxes potentially, so that we can get rid of some of the corporate taxes and, and individual personal income taxes and make America more competitive. But we're not going to, we're not going to tinker. The tax lawyers and the tax uh, lobbyists on K Street are going to, you know, make sure they get around whatever you do until you make the system a lot simpler and a lot fairer. <clears throat> There's a thing on the rise in Washington which, which I call crony capitalism, and both political parties have been doing this. Uh, I've been on the Ways and Means Committee for 10 years, and you sit in this committee and you basically act like Caesar. You do this or that on tax preferences, and it's, and it's an army of people coming to try and carve out a little exception for themselves or their industry um, with the best of intentions, with the best case you know, they can make, and what they necessarily try to do is get a little exemption for themselves and therefore a barrier to entry against their would-be competitors. Um, that is really bad economic policy. We, we disagree on, on, on the components of tax reform, but we agree on the need to do tax reform, fundamental tax reform. I see the tax code as a necessary evil you have to have and to have a society, <clears throat> and we should have a tax system that is as efficient and as lean as possible to raise the proper amount of revenue to finance the government um, and nothing else, meaning we should maximize economic growth. We should not be running social engineering through the tax code. We should not be running um, all this kind of social policy through the tax code because what ends up happening is what's happening right now. The, the, the people who have connections get their little carve out in the tax code and that means everybody else has pays higher tax rates. Now as to the tipping point of um, non-taxpayers, or what we call these in tax policy, we call it negative taxpayers. There is the EIC, which wipes out you know, a lot of the FICA tax liability. Um, there are lots of data that's out there. On income taxes, we're to a point where um, you know, almost half of the country doesn't pay income taxes. There are other taxes, but the point I would make is the trend that is happening in tax law right now, or in the tax code, is we're go moving to more and more people not paying taxes and being net consumers of government than net contributors to government. People call this the tipping point. The Tax Foundation has these statistics they put out. According to the Tax Foundation, when they add up sort of spending and taxes on the federal level, they're saying that about 60% uh, of Americans get more benefit in dollar value from the federal government than they pay back in federal taxes. We've got to watch this. 
The reason we have to watch this is everybody should be a stakeholder in government. Everybody should be paying something, something for government so that they have a say-so. But more to the point is you don't want to have a nation where the majority of people are net consumers and not net producers because that's a country that can't get, can't get out of that kind of a tailspin. That, that creates huge social problems and stagnation and ultimately lower living standards. This one, Congressman Ryan, as you stated, we need adult conversation about this problem. With the current political atmosphere in Washington, what is your assessment of the potential for these adult conversations politically? It's not very good right How now. How do we get there? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, look, I'm kind of, we were just joking about this in the room over here before. I'm kind of the poster child for this stuff now. Um, nobody knows who Paul Ryan is outside of Wisconsin, but you see my picture in TV ads all around the country, you know, as the guy who wants to do these evil things to seniors. Never mind the fact that my bill, you know, doesn't touch anything for anybody over 55. What's happening right now is um, it's an old campaign chestnut of, of, of days of lore. You can scare seniors pretty well in a, with effective scare tactic campaigns. And, and this is why people don't do anything. This is why people don't advocate legislation. This is why they don't co-sponsor legislation, because they're afraid of giving their political opponent a political weapon. The problem we have is we have too many people in Congress, in both political parties, who are so worried about winning or losing the next election than about doing what they think is the right thing. We need more doers in Congress, less beers. Uh, we've got to get through this current silly season. And the way I think about it is, I just quote Winston Churchill, the Americans can be counted upon to do the right thing when they've exhausted all other possibilities. And I think that's probably what's going to end up happening here. And let me, let me just add that one of the reasons the Conquer Coalition goes around the country is uh, not because we just want to scare people and then get back to Washington, uh, but we, because we believe that uh, something will happen, something will change uh, in order for us to deal with this before it becomes a crisis. And what that something we believe in so deeply is, is that we're going to change the ground uh, politically to where it becomes uh, easier for members of Congress to deal with this issue and to answer honest questions and to talk about it with each other honestly than it will be for them to duck the issue. And so uh, we need to change the political calculus. And we've been around the country. We, we did a wake-up tour for three years. We were around the country really describing the problem. Now we've moved on to the solutions tour. And, and what we found every place we've gone is that when the American people hear this uh, from people representing the left, the right, the center, they understand the problem. They're ready to discuss it. Uh, they know that we need to make hard choices. And there's this yearning for leadership uh, from people on Capitol Hill uh, and in the White House to have that honest discussion. It's incredibly difficult uh, to imagine bipartisan cooperation and honest discussion in Washington, uh, but if you look throughout our history, we've met uh, many, many challenges as a nation. We've even had bipartisan budget deals in 1990 and 1997. Uh, so it's not like this can't happen. It's not like we're incapable uh, as a political system of being able to deal with this. And, and I'm sure you can talk about the Wisconsin Fiscal Advisory Council and all the other advisory councils we had around the country. People were itching to get together with other community members to really hammer out solutions and then to be able to come to Washington and tell their congressmen and senators that they were able to have that debate and wondering why that can't happen in Washington. I want to put a plug. The Concord Coalition is the best in the country for doing this. You guys really are. And you guys were doing this before it was cool. I mean, um, not that entitlement forms cool, but you know we're making it as cool as possible. But we've got to make this that the third rail of politics is failing to tackle this problem, not trying to f fix this problem. These guys at the Concord Coalition, they bring people around the country from the left, from the right, from the center, Brookings, Heritage, and everything in between, and they're advancing this to an adult. There's nobody else as well as Concord, as you guys, I got to tell you, that are trying to advance this to an adult level um, with a fairly balanced approach. And my goal is just to put a, is just, be one, I got one thing. I've got a franchise in Congress. Uh, I can control my own actions, not other people's. So I just wanted to put a plan out there to try and get this going. I literally, and maybe this is really naive, I thought if I put something out there, other people would put their plans out there. I really thought that that would sort of try and encourage that from happening. Jump in the pool and tell people to come on in and swim. It's not that bad. And, um, you know, hopefully that one day will become the case. This is from Green Bay. Can you talk specifics about what will get people back to work with so many corporations farming out jobs to other countries? Want to start? You want me to go next? Well... Number one, the biggest problem, uh, and I 
meet with employers every single day here. I call prospective employers to recruit them to Wisconsin all the time. It's this huge uncertainty that's overhanging our economy. Um, when we have deep recessions in America, as we have had in the past, we typically bounce out of them. The bigger the drop, the bigger the bounce coming out of it. Coming out of the 73, 75 recession, the 81, 82 recession, if we measure ourselves against them, we ought to be growing at about 6 or 8%. We're growing at 1.6%. Why is that? I would argue it is because of our current government policy, because of our current fiscal policy, because of all the uncertainty that is overhanging, the uncertainty of what government's going to do, the uncertainty of what the currency is going to be, what interest rates are going to be, what are the taxes going to be in a couple of months, what are the new regulations with all of these new regulatory laws, these new bills coming. So much uncertainty. I'll encapsulate it in this. I was talking to a Fortune 100 company CEO a few weeks ago, trying to recruit him to come in to southeastern Wisconsin. Um, they have land, and we're trying to get them to build a big facility to have lots of really good jobs. And he basically said this, I'm sitting on about $7 billion in cash. I need to do some investment, but there's no way I'm doing it in this country now because of all this uncertainty coming from the government. It, I, I, my board won't let me. So we've got to deal with all of this uncertainty. We need certainty on tax rates, certainty on money, meaning sound money interest rates, and we need certainty on regulations. What are they going to be and how much are they going to cost? Are they going to be made with cost-benefit analysis? Are they going to be made in a very punitive fashion? That's the kind of thing we need to do to unleash the employer to free up credit so that we can get back to growing, get back to hiring. Those are the things we need to do exactly right now to get jobs turned back on this economy. Raising taxes and borrowing and bringing more money to Washington to swish around a bureaucracy and then spend it out through spending doesn't work. We've tried this. We've tried this for the last two years. It has failed miserably. It's not working. We need to go a different direction. I would just say, you know, I wish I was as uncertain as all these corporations who are making record profits right now. Um, and I appreciate that, you know, people want to use the uncertainty because it, it has a certain level of, you know, political uh, viability to it. You know, I talk to lots of CEOs and it's kind of in cool now to say you're uncertain. It's not uncool to say I just made record profits and, you know, part of that is because the government did sort of rescue the economy. No one really wants to ask the banks who we rescued why they aren't lending money to good businesses here in Wisconsin that have had a long history of doing things. So, I, th I mean, I think we have a problem. I think it's way bigger you know, than the government that of this moment in history. We had a jobless decade for 10 years before we had a fiscal collapse. That was not uncertainty that people weren't investing in this country. We had record profits. The gap between the rich and the rest of the population grew as wide as we've ever seen it in this country, and we weren't creating jobs. So to me, this is the third economic revolution. We're in a global competition, and the truth is that many of the jobs that w once were here are being done other places, from architects to lawyers now, to medicine and other things. And I just think, you know, it is too trivializing the situation to say, you know, what corporate leaders are saying, it's just about uncertainty. This has been going on now for a decade. The middle class has been shrinking for even longer. And we need to, I think, have a very grown up conversation with these CEOs about, you know, how they're going to be pro American, how our trade policies haven't have worked, how we could have a more competitive tax program if they would get out and support something like a value-added tax that makes them more competitive in other parts of the country. So I just don't buy in the middle of this political season. It's uncertainty at a time when people are making record amount of money. Andy and I have come to know each other pretty well. Mm -hmm. We can go back and forth mm -hmm. a bit here. Mm -hmm. we've, we've spent some time in this commission. Mm -hmm. I would simply say um, the top tax rate for small businesses is scheduled to go to 44.8% within the next two years. In Wisconsin, our tax rate on small businesses will hit about 55%. Um, that creates a lot of pause. That creates a lot of uncertainty. And, and, and I'm not arguing it's, it's, that tax increases, you know, in the case in what he was just talking about, may or may not. I'm just saying this has gone for a decade. We had a decade with no new net jobs. So to sort of, you know, focus on what happened in the last two years, which was a crisis not created by the current administration, you know, and then ignore the last eight years when we weren't raising those taxes, we were cutting taxes and we weren't creating jobs, seems to defy logic. Let me find This is from Wausau, Wisconsin. Mr. Stern said we are in economic revolution, moving away from services, technology, et cetera. Does that mean manufacturing has no role in any future economic plan? I'd say if we try to just let the market solve this problem completely, 
you know, we will have no future because to have a manufacturing economy, many things Paul said, you have to have a, you have to have a trade policy, a tax policy that makes our companies, countries competitive. You know, you have to figure out a way to bring the money back overseas that companies have parked over there because, you know, the way we deal with our tax system has not made it an incentive to bring it back. We need to decide, is it really okay that other countries make the steel that we use in our battleships or the steel that we use in our state office building. So I don't, th I don't think it's a foregone conclusion, but this is what was said earlier. When we don't have a plan, <clears throat> things happen. It's not as if nothing happens. We lose the manufacturing jobs. And so to me, we will continue to lose manufacturing jobs, not because we have to, but because we don't have an alternative yet that's coherent and an American economic model that works. Uh, our biggest immediate problem is the sluggish economy. Won't the long-term debt be worse if we don't reestablish economic growth? Can't we afford some more debt now in order to let the federal government stimulate the economy? So um, I don't subscribe to the, that certain economic doctrine that suggests that we should um, borrow more now to spend to grow and create jobs. If that worked, we would have a lot more jobs. Um, to get back to the pre-unemployment levels of pre-recession, where we are at 5.5% unemployment rate, we've got to create a quarter million jobs every month for five years running. We're in a really deep hole. Um, I would argue, and I think that most economists would back this up, that if we get a handle on our medium and long-term fiscal problem, that's going to help us right now. That's actually going to help us with interest rates. That's going to help give us more predictability on taxes. That's going to help build confidence. So these things are not mutually exclusive goals. Getting this debt and deficit down over the long term, structurally fixing these problems so that we're getting it under control will be a huge benefit to the economy right now. And borrowing and spending, you know, Keynesian stimulus, um, it just doesn't work. Uh, the, the multipliers that are used to justify this have now proven to be sort of fallacious. And so I don't think that's the path to go. I think there's better kinds of fiscal policy that would get us the jobs right now. I already articulated those. But we shouldn't think that we should, we, if we just borrow spike now, that that's going to help us. No, no, no. Put in place a fiscal plan that gets this thing on the right path, and that's going to help us right now. And let me, let me just add that uh, even if you subscribe to the notion that you need short-term deficit spending to prop up the economy, none of that precludes us dealing with the long-term problem. And in fact, uh, dealing with the long-term problem just reinforces anything you choose to do in the short term. And, and I think uh, what's been missing um, in actually a lot of the media discussion and the political discussion is that there's somehow this, this false notion that you either do something short term or long term. And also, you know, the, the, the whole federal budget represents our plan or our priorities. And if there are things we could be doing better now, even within our current budgetary pie, without increasing the deficit, that could help stimulate economic growth and, and promote jobs. We, we should be taking that opportunity, and we can still be dealing with these long-term plans that phase in over time to deal with the long-term fiscal issue. So really debating the short-term, you know, Keynesian or deficit increasing stimulus versus uh, tax cuts and, and, and all of these issues, uh, none of that has to necessarily increase the deficit to be more effective than current policies. And, and even if you increase the deficit over the short term, you could still, over the long term, phase in much more uh, strong deficit reduction and deal with a lot of these fiscal problems we're, we're talking about. A uh, question for Mr. Stern. Um, you said Mr. Ryan's plans for Social Security and Medicare are the wrong ideas. What are the right ones? I mean, I, I think when it comes to Social Security, they're just a series of choices we need to make. And I happen to be one that believes that the American people, this is one of the few things they would pay more money to do, and that should certainly be on the table. But I think there are all kinds of other issues about, in, you know, why are certain forms of income outside the Social Security system? You know, if I make my money in a dividend check, I don't pay Social Security. If I make my money as a laborer, I do pay Social Security. So. 
you know, there are clearly issues that are going to have to be dealt with about why are public workers outside or not inside? How do we invest the money in Social Security? You know, what does it mean that we only have 83 percent of the wage base in Social Security, not 90 percent of the wage base, which is when it originally was started? So I think there's a mix of policies that you can use here uh, to try to get this balance. I don't believe, I, I, I believe in we need a new retirement security system in addition to Social Security, and we don't need to transfer the money, is where I disagree yeah, with the congressman. Like personal right. I like personal accounts. I don't like Not it being trans yeah. carve out for Social Security. I think the country needs a lot more savings <clears throat> than we have right now for economic growth, as well as to make sure people retire like they used to be able to retire. And on Medicare, I just think it's really, it's complicated. You know, what, what Congressman Ryan does, which works, is for the federal government, which is he just, you know, caps the amount of money the federal government's going to have to pay. And that works fine for the federal government. It's like when your employer caps the amount of money they pay to your health care. The problem is someone else pays. And I don't happen to believe any more than campaign finance that health care isn't going to be a find a way to keep growing in cost if you only try to control one piece of the budget. So I just think it's too small of a solution to really get the whole health care cost under control because someone's going to continue to pay. It's the first time I've been accused of being too small. <laughs> <laughs> and for Congressman Ryan from Oshkosh, for those workers 54 and younger that would retire with a private account, what would happen if they lived longer than expected and <clears throat> outlived their account balance? Yeah, so <clears throat> this is a good question. So personal accounts. So here's what I propose, and I'll do it as quickly as I can. It's a voluntary option. If you want to stay in the traditional system, you can stay in the traditional system. Um, at my age, I'll get maybe a 1% rate of return. My kids are going to get a negative 1% rate of return. That's if Social Security could pay them their benefit, which, of course, we know it can't. So that's why I said, and I think one of the beauties of Social Security is it's been, it's been supported by multiple generations. I think it's going to lose its support among younger people as they realize, you got to remember, 80% of Americans pay more in payroll taxes than they pay in income taxes. So it's going to start losing its support when they get such a rotten rate of return on it. And my kids would do better stuffing all their payroll taxes, 12.65% of their wages in their mattress than if they did put it in the Social Security program. So I wanted to say, let's give them a choice of having a plan exactly like I have as a congressman, as federal workers. It's run by the federal government. It's not privatized. It's just like our thrift savings plan. Safe index funds, and here's how it works. They're index funds that are broad. Um, they adjust as you age so that you're not in the stock market by the time you get near retirement in your 60s and your 50s, and it gets you a much, much better rate of return. Instead of growing your money at negative 1% or 1%, it grows your money at about 6% over the course of your lifetime, so you get a much better benefit, so you have a better payout. I require that people annuitize a portion of their funds, though, so that you buy an annuity that keeps you up way above the poverty line so that that gives you guaranteed cash payments throughout your life, and then what is above your annuity in your personal account is yours to do with it what you want. If you die, that goes to your family. You know, look, my dad died when I was a kid. My mom had a choice. She, could, she worked here, actually, at UWM as a lab technician um, for many, many years um, doing lab research. Uh, and my dad was a, an attorney. He did better. He made more. She had to choose. Does she get his payroll taxes that he paid for Social Security or hers, not both? So she forewent all those taxes she paid in the Social Security system and took my dad's and got like a $750 death benefit. So I think there are inequities in the current system right now that ought to be fixed, especially for women who outlive their husbands. And so why not give a person an, an option of having an account that is actually their property, actually in their name, that the Congress can't raid and take away from them, that harnesses the power of compound interest, that gives them the ability to grow their money faster so that they get a better retirement benefit, so that they have an annuity that keeps them out of the poverty line, and that if they do pass away before, um, you know, whenever they, they think they're going to live, that money goes to their family, that goes to their spouse, it doesn't go back to the government. But, but isn't it, I mean, I totally agree with everything he just proposed, other than where the money comes from. And that's the because, key thing. Because the, the good news for Congressman Ryan is I think he gets a 5% contribution from his employer, the federal government, into his yeah. TSP that's right. account, above and beyond it's Social it's Security. So if every American can do that, we're going to be in good shape. So what, what the issue with that, Andy, it's, it's where, where does the transition cost come from? That's the whole enchilada with this particular issue, which is if I am going to let these young people take a third of their payroll taxes 
put it in their name and their account that's managed by Social Security, again, not privatized, but managed by Social Security, that's that money that's not going into the current system for current seniors, for my mom. So how do you make up that difference? That's why in the roadmap I spell out, you know, basically savings that backfill that money so that that, cover, that is covered so that my mom gets her payment while Josh can take his payment into his, into his account. There are transition costs. What it effectively does is it takes the debt that's out there in Social Security and pulls it into the current window and pays it off on a discounted present value. Now, I'm getting a little wonky here, but the key with Social Security is it's a $5.3 trillion problem. And the question is, is how do we pay off that $5.3 trillion problem? And what does this system look like going forward? We can turn the dials, nickel and dime the program, lower benefits for some, you know, higher taxes for others, or, or a combination of those things. But for these younger people, what it's going to end up being is an even worse rate of return than the one they've already got coming. That's why I think these are issues we ought to be discussing. We are reaching the end of the evening, and out of respect to the fact we are doing this on a university campus, I'm going to let uh, Ask Luda answer a question. Uh, and then I'm going to ask uh, uh, Congressman Ryan and Mr. Stern to just give us a few updates on where the President Commissions is in terms of when the report is due and uh, what expectations, if any, we have. Uh, but the question that came in is, how will we reform entitlements in a way that's fair to young and future generations when older people vote more often than younger people? Parents, don't just say vote more young people. Uh, well, that's easy. I mean, everybody knows the answer to that. Um, it's going to be hard. I mean, you've got a powerful, entrenched interests, well-established, that have uh, money to spend, that have the ear of people who are in positions of power. And so how do you combat that? Well, I think the way you combat it is in numbers. You've got to get people together. You've got to stand up and say, we have a large group of people that are educated about this and call people on the facts. You will not hear uh, Mr. Stern, Mr. Ryan disagree on some of the key facts of what the budget shortfall is. They put up the same charts here. There's no disagreement. If you asked every member of Congress and uh, both the House and the Senate, they would agree with CBO or OMB numbers if, if you took them in a, in a private room and it wasn't going to get quoted for them later. They all agree on the facts. So what, what needs to happen is young people need to get together and in enough size to call to task those people that are either candidates for office or elected officials and say, you agree that these numbers are the case and you're giving us a raw deal and that's not right. And there's a power to that, at least in my mind. Uh, but it needs, to be, it needs to be said by enough people with enough facts uh, and in such a way that there are facts here that, can't, that are not being disputed. And, and also, I, you know, the idea that you would put in parentheses and don't just tell us to go vote uh, is, is really, you know, voting is the heart of all of this. And, you know, um, we get asked a lot about what can I do? How can I make a difference? And we even had that movie, IOUSA, that was at Sundance, and people watched it and got very moved and, and wanted to find out what can they do. Uh, and a lot of them had also seen An Inconvenient Truth. Uh, which came out before. And at the end of An Inconvenient Truth, there are little tidbits like um, change your light bulbs to fluorescence, pick up garbage, recycle. And, and this isn't a problem that we can fix by individuals just doing little things in their home. Uh, this is a problem uh, with our policymakers. It's a problem with the federal budget. And ultimately, we need to convince our policymakers to make these changes. Uh, because we can't just rewrite Social Security law or tax law by ourselves. We have to have our elected officials do it, and that's what our country is all about. That's what the founders set up. And uh, we can't ignore that everything flows from us being able to go out and vote. And I think uh, the last six elections have shown, or the last six years uh, in the three elections have shown that even though there are special interests and, and very powerful groups out there, Ultimately, what speaks are the American people on Election Day. And, and I think we, we can't ever forget that. Organization is very important, and we, we do this Youth Advisory Board because we love working with 
college campuses and, and the youth uh, around the country because this is their issue. Uh, but uh, they can't just get involved with their local campus, they also have to vote. And the more that happens, uh, the louder their voice will be. Congressman Ryan and Mr. Stern, could I ask you to just give us a quick 60 seconds on where the uh, President's Commission is at the moment? Uh, it's, the report is due December 1st, right, Andy? And um, we have yet to decide on the actual recommendations. The way this works is there are 18 commissioners, 14 have to vote in favor of a, of a particular plan to advance it. Um, the promise that was made, because this isn't a statutory commission, it's an executive order commission, is that the majority leader of the Senate will bring the bill up first, then if it passes the Senate, correct me if I'm wrong on this, Andy, then if it passes the Senate, then the, the Speaker uh, Pelosi will bring it up uh, in the lame duck session um, sometime to be determined later, but that means December. Um, but we have not uh, had uh, policies uh, put in front of us um, to vote on yet. So that's going to happen um, probably late November. Okay. So I think the good news is the commission is actually having an adult conversation and, and <clears throat> trying to find its way to see if there's something that can be done. I, I think the, great, the, the real strategic question here is whether, you know, for the president in some ways this is the kickoff of his re-election campaign when this platform yeah. comes out in terms of fiscal responsibility. It's also an opportunity for all the other Republicans who are running for office to sort of be heard. And the question is, are we going to start a silly conversation again afterwards, or are we going to start a responsible conversation about what this country needs to do and who's in better shape to lead it, you know, which I think would be helpful. And then I think the same question will exist for Democrats and Republicans, you know, when the election's over. Is the strategy to sort of tank this thing, you know, or is it better to have the commission make some hard decisions, which you can play off of, and I'm not sure anybody's quite figured out, because no one's quite figured out what's going to happen in the election, which way to go, but I, I just rooting for everyone to say, we're really thankful people, if we can find some way forward, we're really thankful people did it. It's a basis to have that conversation that you've said and have been promoting, and then I hope that people just make a choice, take a vote, you know, win, lose, or draw, whatever it is, we should make some choices around here. I, you, you probably already answered the question, but let me ask, because we got about 10 of these mm -hmm. in, and it's a good sign for democracy as mm -hmm. far as I'm concerned. So this comes from Oshkosh, but they, they were from all over the state. When we leave here tonight, what is the most important thing I as a citizen can do for fiscal reform? Educate yourself. Uh, understand what's going on. Understand the consequences to you, to your family, to your country, uh, and then educate other people so they understand this. Look. This will change when politicians think that the most fearful thing for their political future is not addressing this. Right now, it's the opposite of that. So when those silly conversations start to happen, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or a liberal, progressive, whatever, you have to call to task those who are asking for your vote and say, Again, stop. This is not about having a silly conversation. This is about having either grown-up or adult conversation. And don't let them get away with that. Don't buy into that sleight of hand, uh, distracting um, tactic. I used to say about health care that you know, the, the funny thing about Washington is, is everybody's second choice, if they didn't get their own way, was to say to do nothing. And at some point, whether regardless of what we thought about the health care plan, people understood doing nothing, as we saw in these charts, is not good enough anymore. And I think what we need to appreciate is, I don't care if you're a, on the left or the right, you can argue when the problem begins, you can argue, you know, are people being hysterical about where the numbers go, but you can't argue there's a problem that needs to be addressed in this country. And doing nothing, the second choice in Washington, D.C., is no longer the acceptable solution. We have to do something. Well, I have to tell you, it's been a treat for me. It, uh, I handed out my first piece of campaign literature 56 years ago, um, and I saw a discourse tonight that gives me hope and courage that we can move forward. So I really, I hope you'll join me in thanking this panel of people for showing us how discourse can be. Right. Hey, Thanks. A couple of quick housekeeping pieces. Uh, there will be a third broadcast uh, statewide on October 26th that will focus on the impact of all of these issues on the Wisconsin state budget. Uh, and I hope that you'll be able to tune in and come back down here to Milwaukee and 
other campuses at that point in time. Um, and I'll just leave you with one thought. The, the word politics comes from the Greek word polis, which literally means the business of the people. There is another Greek word, idios, which is the word idiot, which literally means one who is not concerned with the business of the people. You get to go home and off to work or wherever tomorrow confirmed as not being idiots. So keep up the good work. Thank you very much.